All right. This series is about people who need to understand Unigen API. If you're somebody new to Unigen and you have no idea how to create your dev environment and you need to start from the beginning, follow along. First, we're going to go into the website and we're going to go into the downloads and we're going to install the most latest browser that we have available. Uh, you have choices between Windows and Linux. Once you're done downloading it, you will have it in your folder where you can just open it and you'll be logged into this uh, page, which you have to use to log in credentials. The next thing you're going to do is install the Visual Studios community. It's easier than the other options, so I'm going to recommend that. Once you finish installing, you're going to have the installer, and I believe that's about it. So for the browser, you're going to use the same login and password that you used to uh, go into Unigen. And with that, you're going to in go inside. With the Visual Studios, you're going to have to do a little extra. First, we're going to have to click into the modify. And once we do click into that, we're going to have to install a few things. So if you're in C sharp, the only thing you need to install is the .NET and you're pretty much done. So that's it for C sharp. But for C++, you do need to install this alongside one component called the CLI build support and just take the latest click tick and then that's about it. You just click install. Once you're done installing, you close it and then you have your dev environment ready. So you're going to have this, but not any projects over here. That's just me. And the first thing you're going to do is actually go into the SDKs and you're going to install the latest SDK. I already have it installed. So as you can see over here, we installed it. After that, you're going to basically have to create a new project. And the best way to do that is just click create new and choose the specific language you're going to start with. I'm going to choose either the csharp.net or the Visual Studio. Do not choose the Unigen script. And with that done, you can create the uh, project. Once you do, you'll have one of these cards. You can open the card into the specific editor and IDE. Run is specific for after building IDEs for your IDE and editors editor. So after open your editor, you basically have an empty project right here. So what you're going to do after this is basically create a component. We're going to go into our IDE and we're going to go into the app world and we're going to add one of these includes, which allows us to use component systems. Inside our init, we're gonna add these two lines to make sure that we can even do component initializations in the first place. After we are done with that, the next thing we're gonna do is actually go into our project or right click into it, and we're gonna add a class. Now, for this class, you can name it whatever you want. In our case, we're gonna do component check. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is actually fill the class with a little bit of component and in order to make it into a component, all we're going to do is inherit from component base. We're going to register it and we're going to define it. And then once we do build the object or the solution, we're going to have it as a property, which we add to anything in the world. The next thing we're going to do is have a property parameter. This allows us to have properties inside the editor and visually change it. So it starts as a macro of a property param. The first thing is going to be the type with a capital. The next thing is going to be the name that we use in code. The default value is going to be the third argument. The fourth argument is going to be the name that it's going to be in the editor. The fifth one is the hover tooltip info. And the sixth one is the group name. Other than that, there's a three more types of macros. We're going to talk about it later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a few of those right here inside this component. All right. With that done, we're going to add it into our editor and we can see that there's a lot of components inside here. Do not worry about it. We are going to discuss a few of the unique ones inside here. So inside all that code, let's reformat it to the way that we were looking at and let's go buy a few of them. So one of them is the int that we were looking at before. As we can see, the first one on the list, it's a value of three with the ID num. And we can see that the default value is connected, the ID name in editor, the tooltip works, and the group is inside the ingredient. <clears throat> the next thing is a float, which has almost the same. So we can skip on details.
The next one though is the switch. A switch is an enumeration or a list of choices, which we have as the third parameter, which allows us to choose. Other than that, everything else is the same. As for the toggle, this is your Boolean, which checks yes or no. The next one is a double, which allows us to do a higher order number. After that, we have a string with an empty variable, so nothing's inside there. The next three are vector threes, and each one is different. You can have vector fours, twos, and yes. The next one is the property array parameter, which we choose as an int type. And what it does is it gives us a list or a vector of arrays that we have. And in this case, everything else is the same. There is no default value, so do not write any default values. Now, as for specific, we got the mask type, which allows us to choose a specific mass intersection. We also got the color value, which we can choose our specific custom color. We also got file, which we can drag anything from the asset browser inside here. Material is specific to only material objects. And lastly, for node, we can only drag node items in the world inside here. The last thing we're going to check is the property struct, which inside our code, we're going to create a struct which inherits from component struct, and it has its own parameters. So in our case over here, we have the random struct as, as the type, and then we have its own initialized name as admin, and then we can choose whatever we like inside here. It has the hover effect just like before, no default values, and it's under the group struct. Now the next one is an array of that. So we just uh, create an array and it has the same uh, type. So it just creates five types of that struct array. And that's about it. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the execution loop. So the execution loop in Unigen is quite a busy amount of information and there's a lot of stuff, especially with all the backup and the front ups and the loops. But in simplicity, let's just talk about it and how it's used in the component. So in the component, there is about these many available loops that we can choose into. Initializes the beginning loop or the first frame. Then what happens is after that, it goes into the update loop in the exact order that we have. First, it goes into the asynchronous, into the synchronous, into the render update, into post, and then into physics. Once it's done doing that in one frame, it's gonna go into the swap buffer, which allows it to do its final calculations. And then after that, it's gonna go back into the update loop. And that is your loop that goes over and over again for the lifetime. Once the application finishes, then we go into the shutdown and we close our engine. And that's basically the loop setting. Now, why is this important? Very simply put, we can actually use it all in our component. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into the component, we're going to override it, and we are just going to initialize it inside our CPP. And now we are connected into the update loop. Finally, we have something for inheritance. Now, let's just say we have a derived component, which takes in from component check, and we override the init, and we have our own init function inside it. Now we have three different types of behaviors around these. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna have that derived component. We're gonna define it based as an inheritance for component check, and we're gonna have an override init, which we're just gonna do a simple log message for both of them just to see the behavior. Now inside our editor, I'm just gonna create a dummy node, and I'm just gonna add that derived component inside. And as you can see, it inherited everything that the base had. And we have the same thing, but as you can see, this one is inherited. So for our sakes, we're going to mute that base class and we're going to check this behavior out. So as we run the build and we check it up, we can go inside our log and we can see that the derive init has overread and the base one has been overridden. And that is the basics. Now, what if we add the argument of one? We increase the Z index counter. So for this case, what happens is we're going to have it in an execution order of the base being initialized first and then the derive initialized after. 
And as you can see that inside the locks right here, the base came first, and then after that the derived was initialized. Now inversely speaking, if you had this as minus one, while default is zero, what's going to happen is as you expect it, the derived comes first and then the base comes after. So this gives you a bit of freedom in how you want to loop your executions. Now this also works with any other types of loops. So you can do that in threads, updates, swaps, create your own loop magic. Now that's it for the basics. And I hope you guys learned a good chunk and we will have more videos soon. So until then, I will see you guys later. All right, goodbye.